Hey there, everybody. I'm Forrest Valkai. You probably know me as the renegade science teacher from TikTok. And as somebody who teaches science on the internet, specifically teaches evolution on the internet, I get a lot of videos and messages and links uh, to sources that are trying to debunk evolution, not just from fans and from you know anti-fans, but from people who I know, people who are my friends who, uh, who don't believe that science is real. And so I thought it would be fun to start a little mini series reacting to some of these things because I love reaction channels so why not become one kind of part-time as well so this is evolutionary biologist reacts to videos that purport that evolution isn't a thing that's insanely specific and way too long this is scientist reacts to anti-science YouTube videos that's still Super niche. This is Valkai's uh, re the reaction guy. Th this is react and reactimals, the, the animals of reaction, reacting about things. This is re reaction, re 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 biochemical reaction. This is re react reactier reacteria. <laughs> this is this is reacteria where where the knowledge can can divide and spread all throughout the internet. This is reacteria. It's called reacteria. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And today, uh, we're gonna be reacting to this video. I just went to YouTube and typed in, evolution is wrong. And this was one of the top videos that came up. It's called, Six Reasons Not to Believe in Evolution, Proof of God. That's a lot. That's a big claim. That's, that's a, a tall order for a, a nine minute and 14 second video. It's published by the World Video Bible School. It's got 63,000 views. And uh, here's a fun thing. It's got zero comments. It's got no comments whatsoever. Well, it's got one. It's got the pin comment from the poster uh, with links to their other stuff. So 63, almost 64,000 people have watched this and nobody had anything to say. That's very interesting. It seems like they're deleting comments probably comments that are calling them foolish, but whatever. We'll go ahead and rock with it and we'll see what these guys have to say. In the year 2002 in Cobb County, Georgia, there was a sticker that was placed on the inside cover of the biology textbooks. That sticker simply said that these textbooks contain information on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact about living organisms, and it should be looked at with an open mind, studied carefully and critically considered. I actually remember this sticker. This isn't the only one of its kind. There have been lots and lots of little disclaimers on uh, teaching evolutionary biology in public schools across the country. There's a few things that always stick out to me about things like this. The first one being, what is a theory? What does that word actually mean? Because in common parlance, theory is just a wild guess, a random hypothesis, something that you came up with up the top of your head. But in science, it means something very, very different. And when you put stickers like this or disclaimers like this on textbooks, not only are you dissuading people from believing that science is real, but also you are misinforming them. You are teaching them an inaccurate definition of a scientific term. This would be like if you know they had in the book all about what a cell is, but then they also put you know prison cell as part of the, the definition. Yeah, that is one way that the term is used, but that's not what's in this class. And if you go and say, my body's made of cells to somebody, and they go, my body is not a prison full of inmates. That's exactly as dumb as saying that evolution's just a theory. Right, you don't understand what the word theory means. For those of you who are watching who, who don't know what a theory is, don't know what the difference is, which is totally reasonable considering the fact that this is how these things are taught. If I say that I have a theory about why my car isn't working, that just means guess. That's, I have some insight on how mechanics work, maybe not, I don't know. I have this kind of, oh, I feel it shaking like this, I bet that means this thing. A theory is just a random throwaway word. But in science, a theory is a functional explanation for any set of observed natural phenomena that is backed by all the best evidence that we have. So when you throw around words like this, that this is just a theory, well, your body being made of cells is a theory. Germs making you sick is a theory. The earth going around the sun is a theory. Gravity is a theory. 
plate tectonics is a theory. Like, there's a lot of theories in science. That doesn't mean guesses. That doesn't mean untrue. So theory isn't used the same way in science. Theory is the highest level to which you can possibly elevate an idea in science. And to stop the argument before it begins, theories and laws are different things. Theories don't become laws when they're proven. That's another really common misconception. So, like, for example, the law of gravity is F sub G is equal to negative G times M1 times M2 divided by R squared. That's the law of gravity. I can plug any numbers into that and figure out the gravitational pull between two objects. That can work every single time. The theory of gravity is all about space-time, bending around massive objects and pulling other massive objects towards their centers. So theory tells you, like, why. Law just tells you what's happening. And sometimes things have a law without a theory. Sometimes things have a theory without a law. That's not always... So just... Th this is just... People who are ignorant of how science actually works, legislating how science is taught. So, right off the bat, he's opening up with this. I don't know where he's going with it, but uh, unless he's about to turn around and say, this is a really dumb sticker, here's why, we're already not going to be friends, this guy and I. We are 23 seconds in, and we already have a lot of problems. Here are six supposed evidences for evolution that simply are not good reasons to believe in evolution. Number one, vestigial organs. The argument goes that if humans evolved, then they would have had at one time organs that an animal would have used in a certain way, but would no longer be used in that way in the human body, and those organs would begin to atrophy and start to be used. If you did have vestigial organs in your body, that wouldn't prove evolution. You see, evolution has to go from a single-celled organism to a human, and you don't need organs that are decaying and atrophying. You need evolution to produce new organs. We should find wings that are almost ready to allow organisms to fly that can't yet fly. We should find new visionary optical connections in living organisms that don't have them. We should see things adding information, not losing genetic information. Okay, so this is just a fundamental misunderstanding of what evolution is and how it works. Evolution is not an inventor. It's a tinkerer. Sometimes we get totally new structures. Sometimes we lose structures. But more often than not, it's just taking what's there and twisting it and changing it. That's why this whole argument about like half a wing or half an eye just doesn't make any sense. That's been a, a bad, outdated argument since the very beginning, since the very first time it was made. Take, for example, an eye. You don't find creatures out there in the wild that have like one half of a functioning eye that doesn't really do anything and we're just waiting for the millions of years to pass for that eye to become fully formed. That's not how it works at all. What you have is a patch of photosensitive cells that slowly get better and better and more and more efficient at capturing information. Take, for example, iguanas. Iguanas have a third eye up on the top of their head, just a little patch of cells that can detect shadows. Is it a fully formed eyeball? No. Is it ever going to become one? Who knows? But right now, it serves the purpose of showing them if a predator is coming in from ahead and swooping overhead, they can see the shadow so they know to react to that. So, like, it's not like a half weird eye. It's a functional organ that later on becomes functional in a better way and then later on becomes functional in an even better way. It's just step by step by step and every single step has to be a good thing. So, this whole half a wing, half an eye thing... It, it, it just makes no sense. Also, the idea that evolution never takes away information. Of course it does. It does all the time. That's the whole point of vestigial structures, is you have something that's left over that is no longer useful, and so either it decays and just completely goes away because you're not using it, so there's no reason for the genes to be preserved, so if the genes get destroyed, there's no selection pressure against that, or you get what's called an exaptation, which is where you have this vestigial structure now used for something completely different. Because again, evolution's a tinkerer. It takes what's there and it just manipulates it into something else. So if you have this vestigial structure that's doing nothing and you find a way to live using it, that now gives you selection pressure towards that and you can get what's called an exaptation from that. So like, you just, you made a bad argument here. You made an argument just completely from nothing at all. The second problem with the vestigial organ 
argument is that that 185 list of vestigial organs, it began to dwindle very rapidly. Do you know as we look more into the body, we realize that those vestigial organs were very useful. This is almost a good argument. The idea that we're finding out more and more that these vestigial structures are actually useful in some way or another. Take, for example, the appendix. For a long time, we thought that the appendix was just completely useless, uh, but now we found out that it actually has a lot to do with maintaining your gut biome. And if you ever, like, somehow lose your gut biota, you, you know, take antibiotics or, or whatever, of course, you didn't evolve with antibiotics, but, like, something happens that ruins the flora in your, in your intestines, your appendix has a little packet of all the, the bacteria that you need to replenish. So like we're no longer calling the appendix a vestigial organ because we found that it actually is useful. But the graphic that you used here, driving that number all the way down to zero, that makes no sense because there are plenty that are very clearly useless. You even showed a few of them here. You've got the erector pili muscles that give you goosebumps. You've got your uh, coccyx, your, your tailbone. That does absolutely nothing for you. Um, you've got another one here, your Darwin's tubercle. Darwin's tubercle is this little bump on the back of your ear. Does nothing. Here's a really great one. Is this tendon right here that connects this muscle right here in the middle. This is called palmaris longus and it does absolutely nothing. In fact, it's so useless that if I get like any kind of tendon damage anywhere else in my body, a doctor would harvest this and use it elsewhere in my body because it does nothing for me here. It is so useless that about 14% of people, depending on the population, there are some populations where it goes up to about 65%, don't have it at all. So on average, 14% of humans don't even have this muscle. If it's so important and integral that it's supposed to be there, how can we have you know, between like a quarter to a half of a population that doesn't even have it. So there are plenty of vestigial structures that are completely, clearly useless. And you're just kind of saying that we found that a bunch of them are useful. That's true. You haven't given any examples and you're ignoring the ones that aren't useful at all. Number two, the idea of homology. We're told that similarity proves ancient ancestry. And what I simply mean by that is we're told that because humans have similar physical characteristics to certain animals, that proves that they evolved from animals. Well, similarity doesn't prove evolution at all. In fact, you could see things that are similar and you would realize that those similarities are often caused by a common designer. Oh, here we go. Suppose there were a supernatural intelligent designer and he created a world where many organisms would need to drink the same water, eat the same kinds of food, walk over the same types of terrain. What would happen? Well, obviously he would use similarities, similar structures to accomplish his goals. Okay, so what you're doing here is you're begging the question. You're saying there's a creator. He made everything and he would do it the same way. Therefore, we see these homologous structures which verify that there's this creator. Now, you can very easily try to turn that around and say, well, evolution's doing the same thing. I think they evolved and therefore it looks like this. The difference is, in science, we look at the evidence and we say, where is this evidence pointing to? And then we go with that. What you're doing here is saying, here's the solution that I'm trying to get to, let's go find evidence for it. And that doesn't work. Because what you ended up doing here is now, instead of just explaining why homology doesn't make sense to you, you've invented a totally new different claim that now there's this creator here that you now have to justify. You, you have made a completely different argument. You haven't just gone to say, hey, this doesn't prove evolution. You've said this actually does prove something else, which you haven't provided any actual evidence for. And beyond that, you've made another claim about that designer's characteristics, about how they think and how they operate. That, of course, everything lives on the same earth, so this designer gave them all similar characteristics. What about the ones that they didn't give those characteristics to? What about the ones that have characteristics that don't suit the way that they live? What about whales, for example? If you look at almost any tetrapod, you've got this same bone pattern of one bone, two bones, little bones, long bones. And you see that in dogs and in humans and in sheep and in chickens and in bats and in whales and dolphins and porpoise. The ancestors of whales were land animals that evolved back into the water to become marine organisms. Whales have little hip bones and leg bones that you can't even see because they're tucked up under all their blubber. Those are vestigial structures, by the way which helped to verify their evolutionary past. 
Now granted, that isn't always the case. There are some structures that resemble each other, but those two organisms don't have a common ancestor that had those same structures. That does happen, but we have a word for that. It's called analogous structures. It's called convergent evolution, finding the same body plan. Like for example, wings. Wings have evolved independently several different times. Eyes have evolved independently several different times. They didn't share an ancestor that had wings or eyes, but individually, they all got it. Supposed evidence for evolution number three, the fossil record. But if you were to take that seriously and you were to go to the fossil record, what you would find is that those transformational fossils are missing on a grand scale. In fact, evolutionist Mark Ridley stated that no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. I recognize that name. Hold on a second. Okay, so I just Googled Mark Ridley. And uh, he is an esteemed evolutionary biologist who writes textbooks, college textbooks, about evolution. So you're telling me that the person who literally studies and teaches this stuff for a living doesn't buy it or, or doesn't believe in a big, major chunk of it? Let's look up that quote really quick. Okay, so it looks like that is a real quote. It's from an article in New Scientist from 1981. 40 years ago. When was Tiktaalik discovered? Tiktaalik was discovered in 2004. Tiktaalik is one of the most famous transitional fossils in history. So this was 20 years before that. So this guy said in the 80s that we don't have enough transition fossils. We've gotten some since then. We've gotten quite a few. And it looks like you didn't even read the whole quote. He goes on to say, So just what is the evidence that species have evolved? There have traditionally been three kinds of evidence, and it is these, not the fossil evidence, that critics should be talking about. The three arguments are from the observed evolution of species, from biogeography, and from the hierarchical structure of taxonomy. So he isn't saying that the fossil record is untrustworthy or wrong. He's saying it's not the best evidence that we have, and we should be talking about these other three really good ones. So you didn't even read the whole quote, and the quote's outdated. So either you don't know what you're saying, or you're just deliberately being dishonest here. Either way, do better. Now, why would he say that? Well, he would say that because when you look at the fossil record, you see organisms coming into the fossil record fully formed. You see a stage of stasis where they do not change, and then they go out of the fossil record without evolving into anything else exactly as the creation model would predict. You did the thing again. You did the thing where you completely misstate how something works and then use that misstatement as evidence for a totally new claim that you are now interjecting into the conversation. What you just described here is not how the fossil record works. You've described a really, really weird model of what we would call punctuated equilibrium. What you don't understand is how adaptive radiation works, how the founder effect works, how bottleneck effects work. These things aren't coming in fully formed. Every organism is fully formed. So like, you're just completely misinterpreting and misrepresenting how evolution actually works to make a straw man argument for your creationism. And the thing is, I don't think you're trying to make a straw man argument because a straw man argument would be better than this. I think that you just don't know what you're talking about. Number four, the idea of mutations. We're told that mutations prove you could get a certain single-celled organism to mutate over multiplied millions of years and bring about new information on a grand scale that given enough time, you could get a human being. What's the problem with that line of reasoning? The problem is that mutations don't give us new information. Yes, they do. Mutations can only take information that is already available and cause it to decay. That's not true either. Mutations are an example of a loss of genetic information. No, they're not. They can be, but they're not always. A mutation is just a change in your genetic code, in your DNA or your RNA, if you're an RNA type creature. 
Those come in a lot of different styles and flavors. You can have a translocation event where you just move a gene from one chromosome to the next or from one place to the next on the same chromosome. You can have an inversion where something gets flipped around. You can have a duplication. That's, if anything, is adding new information. That's literally taking what was there and doubling it. There are a bunch of different kinds of mutations. And even if you just want to talk about one single point mutation, one single nucleotide, one letter on your DNA switching around, depending on what you call new, that's still creating a new word. And even that, there's different kinds. There's a nonsense mutation, there's a missense mutation, there's a silent mutation. All three of those are changing just one letter, and then we determine what that actually does, if anything, to your DNA. So like, no, mutations bring new information all the time. Sometimes they lose information, which is actually sometimes beneficial to a species. Like. This isn't anything about how mutations actually work. Let me give you an example. For the last hundred years or more now, scientists have been studying fruit flies. They are great examples of how you can mutate an organism. We have been zapping these fruit flies with radiation and mutating them in chemical ways for more than a hundred years now. And what do you have after all the radiation and mutation? Do you have a fruit fly that has evolved new genetic information? No, you don't. In fact, all you still have is a fruit fly. It hasn't evolved into anything else. That's not how anything works. I can't just take a fly and blast it with radiation and tomorrow it's a dog. That's not how anything works. Those experiments that you're talking about using Drosophila flies, they're incredibly common because they're ways that we can literally watch evolution happening. Evolution is all about selection pressure. There's a random mutation, and then we have non-random selection by way of nature interfering. If this mutation is beneficial, then this thing is going to live and spread its genes, and that mutation is going to propagate out throughout the generations. If it's a deleterious or harmful mutation, that thing is going to die. It's not going to have as many children, whatever, and so that DNA isn't going to spread out. With Drosophila flies, yeah, we can tinker on their DNA a little bit and we can see the effects of that and then we kill all of the flies and those don't spread. This isn't how evolution works. You're just saying words and then saying, see, evolution isn't true when you haven't actually backed that up at all. See, again, I, I don't think that you're trying to make a straw man argument here. All this strikes me as is that you have never once taken the time to actually learn anything that you're trying to debunk here. You've never heard any counter arguments to what you already believe, and so you decided to put it on the internet. Like, that's that's what this is striking me as. This isn't you deliberately trying to mislead people. This is you just regurgitating whatever somebody else said to you. That That's what this hits me as. Number five, English peppered moths. We're told that English peppered moths provide an example of evolution in action. You see, before the Industrial Revolution, there were two varieties of English peppered moths. One dark colored, one light colored, but the light colored was much higher in ratio than the dark colored. But after the Industrial Revolution, the dark colored became the more prominent color in the light, the fewer in the mix. And we're told that's because birds could see the light colored better, etc. And this was supposedly an example of natural selection. The problem with this example is, number one, many of the pictures were faked because the English peppered moths don't often land on tree trunks, and the entire idea was flawed in that way. But the second problem was that before the Industrial Revolution, the genetic information in the English peppered moth genome had genetic information for two varieties, light colored and dark colored, and after the genetic information was the same. English peppered moths simply do not prove Evolution. Okay, so even if I'm going to grant you the first part, that these moths just don't land on trees, sure, why not? There were a lot of pictures that were faked back then in, in like nature documentaries and for, for natural purposes, sure, maybe. The second part of that statement, you just ran full force into the premise and still missed it somehow. You said yourself that these two different types of moths existed before and after the Industrial Revolution, but in different frequencies. And that doesn't prove evolution. That's the definition 
of evolution. The textbook definition of evolution is a change in allele frequencies within a population over the course of multiple generations. That's what you just described. There was an allele for light colors, there was an allele for dark colors, the allele frequency was such that there were more light than dark, and then an event happened and the allele frequency changed over the course of generations. You just defined evolution and said that doesn't prove evolution. <laughs> And number six, horse evolution. But this scenario, it's fabricated. It's not true. It was made up. In fact, more than 50 years ago, Dr. George Gaylord Simpson said, the uniform continuous transformation of Hierocatherium into Equus, so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers, never happened in nature. Before I say anything, I'm just going to Google George Simpson horse evolution. I'm just going to type that into Google, see what we find. Literally, the top of the page, he was an expert on extinct animals and their intercontinental migrations. He anticipated such concepts as punctuated equilibrium and dispelled the myth that the evolution of the horse was a linear process culminating in the modern Equus cabalis. So, again, you have somebody who studies and teaches evolution for a living, and you're trying to convince me that they don't even believe in what they're talking about. And right here, just the first result on Google shows that you're, you're making this up. You're just completely misrepresenting what he said. In your quote here, it says, the continuous transformation from one thing to another. That's what he disproved. He showed that horse evolution is a lot more complicated than just this became, this became, this became, this. He showed that it's a lot more interesting than that. The same reason why we don't have that old Zallinger projection of human evolution anymore. Back in the 60s, there was a Time Life book called Early Man, which had this terrible illustration by this guy named Zallinger of a monkey slowly like leveling up and becoming a human. We used to think that horses did the same thing. The reason we don't have these diagrams anymore is because they're misleading. They leave a lot of stuff out. Human evolution and horse evolution are the same way. They're not just one step to the next. They're a tangled, crazy bush, a web of different interbreeding and different little speciation events. So that's what George Simpson's saying here. He said it's not a continuous transition. It's this crazy, tangled web. There are a lot of other resources here showing Simpson's work and how he proved this wrong and what he actually like proposed and, and you you just you just you even cited the thing you cited life of the past let's look that up an introduction to paleontology is this a textbook so you're citing a paleontology textbook as proof that paleontology isn't a valid science what you see this information that's presented to us as proof that evolution actually occurred is not proof at all. If we look at it with an open mind and we study it carefully and we critically consider it, we'll realize that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and all of the organisms and evolution just simply didn't play any part in God's creation. Okay, again, what you've done here is made a totally new claim that you now have to support. This is what's called the either or fallacy. The idea that I think it's this and you think it's that. If I can prove it's not that, then it's clearly absolutely only this. Even if everything you said here were proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that evolution was wrong, you haven't done a single thing to back up your claims in evolution. This would be like me saying, I have a Christmas present. I didn't buy it. It must be from Santa. Santa Claus is real. You cannot prove me wrong because I know I didn't buy this Christmas present. So you haven't actually accomplished anything that you're claiming to do here. You haven't debunked evolution. You haven't given proof for God. You've just presented a lot of really weird arguments in a really dishonest way. And oh, sweet Gilgamesh, there's an evidence for God link here too. And it's just a place where you can buy his DVD. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So, wow, uh, way to start the whole series of, of Reacteria off. Um, I give this video a, uh, a science teacher challenge level three out of 10. 
3 out of 10. I would say that a 2 would probably be something that you can just tear through with basic logic, and uh, a 4, you'd probably need some sort of knowledge of the subject material. Uh, this one's a 3 because you can get through it completely unscathed if you know how to use Google. Overall, uh, bad. Just, just real, real bad. You did a bad job, Kyle. Thank you so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing, and all the other stuff that you do here on YouTube. If you enjoyed this video or didn't enjoy it, please leave me some feedback in the comments below. I love hearing what you guys do and don't like, what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of. Uh, I'm Forrest Valkai, the Renegade Science Teacher. Have an awesome rest of your day and never stop learning. Bye-bye.